Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Habitat Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Van Hees, and we are here to become better Habitat Managers. We do that by interviewing all the experts and gurus and regular guys like you and I out there becoming better Habitat Managers. I'd like to first off thank the listeners for tuning in once again this week. We have another great episode where we talk to you guys, the listeners. We put a post out on social media on what questions uh, you'd like us to discuss with our upcoming 2019 plans, uh, both habitat and hunting. So I got Brian, the co-host on the line, and Al from Ohio, also a contributor to the podcast. He is on the line as well. And we dive into these great listener questions. That's a really good discussion on it. Uh, I had a really good time chatting with these guys, uh, you know, talking habitat. I love this stuff. Um, I'd also like to thank... A couple of the listeners for their iTunes reviews. Doug Dog wrote, Very informative. Helpful for everyone trying to make their land better for wildlife. Great speakers with lots of knowledge. Highly recommend. Doug, we really appreciate that review. I will find you on Facebook, sir, for the decal. Here's another one from Buckmark5. Seen a lot of buzz around Facebook about this podcast, so I thought I'd check it out. Man, I'm hooked. Keep them coming. Mike B. Mike, I will be sure to find you and get you that decal. Thank you guys so much for those reviews. That's like my favorite part of this whole thing is just hearing that type of feedback and, and you know, enjoying that you guys are learning along with us. So thank you so much for those iTunes uh, podcast app reviews. Like I said, I'll get you guys those decals. Moving on, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We have Packer Max Call to Packers, The Habitat Hook, Dip That Hydrographics, Michigan Whitetail Pursuit and Killer Food Plots. You know, those are the the friends and sponsors that help support this show, guys. We'd appreciate it if you checked out their websites. Um, all their info is on our Facebook page and habitatpodcast.com. All right. Without further ado, let's get these listener questions covered. All right, guys. We are back. Another episode of the Habitat Podcast. On the line tonight, my co host Brian Hallbly and full time podcast contributor Al James. How are you tonight, Al? I'm doing good, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's habitat season. I got a a bush latte here. I got Brian on the other line. What's up, Brian? What's going on, my friend? You know, we had a couple warm days and uh and trees are starting to be shipped to uh at least around here i know Corey's going down to get our tree order uh here shortly get those in the ground from morse how about you guys what's new down in ohio and pa no same same uh same with you man i actually just got a order uh, i've ordered a lot of trees over the years from uh, stark brothers nursery out of missouri um so i ordered some trees from them this year, I actually, uh, I just got them yesterday, uh, I think. So I'm going to get some trees. I'm at, Normally, I'm like way ahead. I think normally I've had trees ordered for a while and had them in the, even some in the ground. But uh, I just got some of mine and I'm going to be planting them probably on uh, this coming Friday. So kind of in the same boat uh, as you guys. You've had pretty good luck with those trees from Stark, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've had... Uh, Really good luck with them, actually. Other than the mistakes that I made one year, I, I tried to, I kind of was making it way over complicated for growing fruit trees, and uh, decided to spray them with this preventative. Um, I don't know what it was. I think it was a preventative, um, like bug repellent type of spray. And uh, what I didn't realize, I read the whole label, but uh, what I didn't realize is that if it got up past like 75 degrees that day, it would uh, most likely kill the tree. So I killed like a bunch of the trees. Right? That was, <laughs> that was like, a, oh, yeah, I called the company. I'm like, what happened? You know, because I would rinse my sprayers out. I knew there wasn't any GOI or anything in the sprayer. And um, I'm, I'm like, you know, what, what happened? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's kind of hidden. Uh, but, yeah, if you spray it and it warms up, 
and uh, it can actually uh, burn and sometimes kill the tree. Wow. I was like, well, I was like 100%, so it, it definitely killed all of the trees that I sprayed it on. So, But other than that, um, the Stark Bros trees, I've had really good success. They've been really hardy. They have grown um, really, really well. They come pre-pruned. I think I got a bunch of different options. Okay. I think you might, you know, but they come pre-pruned. Um, so they kind of take a natural um good shape right away and then of course you have to continue to prune them back but uh they've, they've been good trees for me awesome man and brian the pennsylvania killer what's going on with you my man well i did a couple videos that you guys saw about the uh pears and the chestnuts got a handful of those in and done and caged and i'm just waiting on some norway spruce i got a bunch of those coming i'm probably going to ship here when I'm in Florida, but uh, I got a dog sitter and a house sitter, so just have them throw them in the basement. They'll be okay. And where are you getting those Norways from? The Norways are from Coldstream Farm. Okay, yeah. I've got, I've got, uh, they've got an, an eBay page that uh, you can get some good bundles and some good deals from, but it's not the eBay page is not the Coldstream name. It's it's something else I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but uh, I've had good luck with those, and uh, I also got some miscanthus coming from Maple Creek. Uh, they'll probably ship those out here in the next couple of weeks. So, got enough stuff to keep me busy until it's time to start prepping plots. You know, nice. I noticed that on their because I'm filling out my cold stream order right now, and by the time this podcast airs, I'll probably have it delivered i hope but i i know that i looked at some of the pictures of the um stream call willows on their website it's the same picture on the ebay site as well so i assume it's probably where you're getting your norways from um i think i'm gonna pick up some of those stream codes as well like we talked about in the last podcast intro and and get those in the ground but um no that's uh that's a good farm here in Michigan. So we're getting trees from all over the country, it seems, between the three of us. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And don't forget about uh, Turkey Creek is another good option because a lot of times people will sell out yep. and um, they got to bounce around. But Chris is real good. I think he's got a few things left if you go to his website. Uh, he's always taking care of me and sending me some great trees. So lots of options out there. Yeah, for sure. It seems, uh, you know, if you're not out planting trees or, or hinge cutting or getting your, your spring food plot prep, I mean, the, the steelhead are running over here, the walleye are running in Michigan. I mean, there's turkey season starts very soon. There's never a shortage of things to do here in the spring. But it's like too much at one time. Yeah. Yeah. No too many doubt. hobbies, if you ask my wife. Too many hobbies. But... Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I wanted to get you on the podcast to cover, you know, some listener questions this week. Um, we put a, a post up there on Facebook and Instagram. We got some good questions from a few of our listeners. I want to talk about those with you guys. And also, uh, once we wrap that up, get into maybe some of your goals this year for, for your farms, for your habitat, and uh, even your hunting, if we get into it. So uh, where do you guys want to start? There was one question on Facebook. Jared Michael asked, why does Al and why does Brian, or why do Al and Brian have such manly equipment and all Jared uses is a small ATV? That's a good question. Can you guys expound on that? I think you just answered it. You said you have too many hobbies. <laughs> yeah, good point. Whittle some of those down and divert some funds from other places. Yeah, yeah, this is more of a therapy session than a podcast. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's uh I've thought about the tractor for a long time and it's just like don't have enough ground to make it to make it worth it. Um and now it's kind of like how much can I do with this ATV, you know? I've done everything so far. Might as well keep trying. Well, and there's so many ATV attachments available today that you can pretty much, unless you're trying to do some kind of giant scale 
food plotting. You, you should be able to handle everything that comes down the pike with it. I, I don't remember how long you were following me on the deer hunter uh, forum. <clears throat> I had my old 25 acres in, in uh, right outside of Cambridge, Ohio. If you remember that, those threads, if you were paying attention to that, I started out with, you know, walk behind tillers and rakes and backpack sprayers and it's taken me quite a few years to get where I'm at with equipment wise and <clears throat> I really didn't have a choice because now that I've got some bigger fields I had to upgrade over the years but it's just been a piece at a time all used equipment um, Craigslist and in the local uh, rags at the tractor supply or the local diners by your farm that usually have a classified you can you could do pretty good with a couple hundred bucks a little bit at a time, picking up a piece here and there. Well, that's a good point. Al, what are you using these days? Yeah, well, uh, we saw your I Facebook post extra, the other day. You were throwing yeah, some I lime got, out. Yeah, I got, uh, I'm pretty fortunate. I got two different tractors. Uh, I got one at the house. It's just, uh, um, what I would actually recommend for, for somebody who has, a smaller chunk of ground, um, depending on how, you know, how flat it is and stuff. I mean, it's got four wheel drive. It's a Kubota. Um, I think it's the 25 horsepower, um, with the front end loader, which is a must, I think for, if you're going to buy a tractor, spend the money on a front end loader, especially if you do have Hills, you'll, you'll, uh, <laughs> you'll definitely thank me later <laughs> for having a front end loader. It just balances that tractor out and you'll use it more than, then you realize, and then uh, uh, down in southern Ohio, uh, I have a 38 horsepower uh, Kubota, um, and that's what I, I was spreading the line with. But uh, both of them, I mean, both the, even that littler or smaller tractor tractor will uh, run a Class One PTO implement. So I could bounce implements back and forth if I wanted to. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I think that's important. You know, when you're looking at those compact tractors, it's just you know, you don't want to have to buy like specialty uh, implements for your PTO. Like, especially if you want to buy stuff off of Craigslist, it's so you want to buy an older PTO spreader. Like you want to just be able to know like, Oh yeah, it's going to fit, you know, and most of the older stuff that's used was all built. I believe for that, like I think it's called the class one um, PTO, but basically that means you can run them off of, off of both. I don't know for sure, but I think that there's some compacts out there. That you have to buy like specialty um, equipment. So just like something to look in. I don't know if all the terminology is exactly matching up, but I remember when I was buying the one for the house, I, I wanted to make sure I could switch them back and forth. So those are the two that I have. Um, and then, uh, you know, just four wheelers, stuff like yeah. that, that, uh, help us get around. And some of those are getting a little bit older and beat up, but they still work just fine. Yeah. I think that's some good information there. I wouldn't have thought about making sure all the implements, uh, are interchangeable, or at least if you buy that subcompact tractor, you're not dealing with some subcompact implement, if that's even a real term, but some specialty implement, like you said, to where you're limited. That's a great point. Um, it kind of, I mean, where I started as well, Brian, I I started with a, a rake and a little Scott's fertilizer spreader, um, the whole thing. So, and even last year, now that I had a quad, I still tried the, the Phil Holcomb no-till um, spray and broadcast, and that worked awesome. I didn't even use an ounce of gas. I mean, that was pretty interesting. So for listeners out there, there are ways that you can get out there and, and get some of this habitat work done in terms of food plots without very much equipment at all. Um, you know, if Brian was still using his push-behind rotary tiller, it would take him about a month to do his farm, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'd get it done though I'm sure if you know he put the sweat equity in but well that's that's the, the thing when you own a piece of property and I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about that's listening how resourceful you can get because you know we're all doing this as a hobby well, I shouldn't say all but the majority of us are doing this as a hobby and the funds and the time only goes so far, so you're, you're constantly playing MacGyver. <laughs> you guys know who MacGyver is, or does the old guy got to explain who that is to you? I know who MacGyver is, but go ahead yeah. and explain it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm just checking. 
so every once in a while I'll throw out an old man reference and I'll, I'll get in trouble for it. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it, you can pretty much get everything done that you want. Now, <clears throat> I'm to the point where I'm putting in, you know, 10% of my 40 in food plots. And, wow. uh, you know, we're talking four, four acres and it's, it takes everything I can do to, to do it on my 1983 John Deere three cylinder. And, uh, I shouldn't admit this, but I'm still tilling the ground. I'm trying to get a little bit better and teach myself a little more about the no-tilling. And I just haven't been able to get too much too much set aside to buy a no-till drill. So I'll keep doing what works for now. Yeah, and I think you mentioned a good point there. I mean, we've been talking about that a lot. I think, you know, ever since we interviewed Eric a while back and we talked to a lot of people about it, but, you know, the, the no-till or no-till drill or, or just not rototilling your soil is better for the, the soil and the, the biology in the soil and the organisms. But, you know, if you got to get done what you got to get done. And sometimes it's still fun to play farmer and flip the dirt, you know. Um, Definitely. I don't expect everybody to go sell their rototiller and, and buy a no-till drill, right? I mean, but as long as you're conscious of, ero- conscious of erosion and things like that, you know, um, I know Mark Drury talked about building uh, like erosion berms on some of his food plots, etc., to try to fight some of that. So there are ways to at least be considerate. Um, that's a pretty good segue into our first question, Brian. Dan Wilkes, a Facebook follower, put a, a question up about some planters. Um, he said, I have a listener question. Grain drill? Ferminator, Plotmaster, Genesis, or bigger drill cut down? What are the pros and cons of using something like this, and uh, should I go no-till or conventional farming tillage? Brian, what do you think about those? Well, for sure, like we talked about, you have to have a tractor with enough horsepower or some type of uh, side-by-side or something that can match up to whatever direction you want to go. <clears throat> Some of those grain drills are pretty heavy. Uh, I, I know even a lot of the soil and water, the local conservation offices will have no-till drills available for rent, which is pretty sweet. But the problem I run into, like I said, my tractor's only pushing maybe 24 horse. And um, <clears throat> I'd have trouble being able to hook up the grain drill that I could rent in my county. So that that's one thing. Double check that. Make sure you've got enough lift and make sure you've got enough oomph in your um, power plant that you're going to be able to pull whatever thing that you're thinking about getting into. I can't really speak for um, pros and cons for like the Ferminator or the Plot Master. I've never used those plot food plotting specific um machines but i know like steve bartilla um really has good luck with them and a lot of guys that use them i've never heard anything bad about them especially the um, atv mounted models like in your situation a lot of guys are using atvs as their power plant and uh, they're having really good luck with them so I, i'd say don't be afraid of them if you want to go that route they are a little bit pricey so that would be a con you know if, if you're pinching pennies like I do uh, a lot of times for the price of a <clears throat> ferminator or plot master you can get a really good used tractor and a couple of implements with it and still have some money in your pocket and I'm not trying to talk anybody out of those because like I said they're great pieces of equipment but just try to match it up with what your goals are what your budget is and um, what kind of power plant you have to pull things I like it yeah, what do you think about that question? Any any input? Yeah, I think that uh, Brian hit on a lot of good points. I think that, number one, you have to have established goals. So one of the things that you guys first talked about, <clears throat> about, uh, you know, tilling or not tilling and, and things like that is, you know, we've, we've said this on the podcast before and you all have had other interviews is you, know, you have to be realistic with, with your goals, right? If you're planting, you know, half acre every year and, and that's all you're, 
all your, you know, able to, to plant and stuff, that's, that's awesome, you know, but you got to use with what you have. So maybe a, a, a drill is not, uh, the, the, it's not a feasible option, right? The other thing that you have to be cognizant of when you're looking at these things, especially when uh, referencing cut down drills is a lot of times there's things that are planters and there's things that are drills. You know, when a planter still needs the ground worked and fitted um, before, you know, pl- like that's a typical farming practice, right? Is you'll see guys turn soil over and then they'll fit the ground and then they'll come back and they'll run a planter through the ground, you know, and uh, <clears throat> normally the, the corn pops up and it's knee high by the 4th of July in those fields, you know, it looks great. Um, and they, it may add a lot of fertilizer and things like that to it. Um, but that's typically like a planter. So a drill um, does not need the ground to be uh, worked. I mean, you, you can't, you know, just uh, cut through, I don't know exactly what the parameters are. I mean, you can't cut through anything, right? But in, in, a, in a perfect world, uh, a drill will actually cut through the soil, um, plant it, and then cover up the seed. You know, at least that's the way I've always kind of defined it in my in my head. So I just like to make sure that there that is clear because I've seen a lot of times where people put things on Facebook or or a forum and they'll say, "Hey, is this drill going to work?" And I'm looking at it and I'm going, "Well, that's that's more of a planter than a drill. You know, that's not really going to drill the so- seed into the soil more than it's just going to drop it." So then it kind of goes back to, well, like, what's the goal? Is the goal to have like really pretty, you know, food plots? Is the goal to um, you know, eliminate opportunity for erosion and to grow, uh, you know, get uh, increase your organic matter in the soil. Um, you know, what's your goal? I'm not going to sit here and say one's better than the other. I try to reduce the amount I till. I do not have a no-till drill right now. Um, so to me, the goal has been to what can I do to in, to limit my tilling but still increase organic matter um, in the soil, you know, so I can, you know, go into depth there. But for that question specifically, I think you really have to look at your goals, um, identify, like Brian said, the spec on those goals, and then, you know, and then kind of decide, okay, what do I want to do? Um, if you're not overly worried because you say you're doing a, a half acre and you're going to till and it's not a, say it's not a real steep slope, you're like, hey, I'm only doing a half acre And I want this plot to be as beautiful as it can be, as weed free as it can be. You know, every year I'm going to come in, I'm going to round up, burn it down. I'm going to till it under. I'm going to let it grow up again. I'm going to burn it off again with herbicide. I'm going to put in organic matter, chicken litter. I don't know, something like that. And then I'm going to plant it. And every year I'm going to have softball sized turnips. Well, it'd be really hard to argue with somebody if that's the way they want to spend the money and that's what they want to do Great to grow that plot. Yep. So I, I think that it's really situational. Um, but I definitely, definitely, definitely think that, um, you know, right now everybody is, is kind of hammering on, you know, organic matter, organic matter, organic matter, which it's, it's important, but it might not be important to, to every single person. And it might not be important to the guy who puts in, you know, one or two plots and gets to hunt three times a year. So um, I, I still think it's important, but in the grand scheme of things, like where does, you know, controlling invasives fall compared to worrying about tilling a half acre? Like to me, that's total different ends of the spectrum. And I can say controlling invasives is, is far more important than worrying about tilling a half acre, in my opinion. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think you have to kind of balance those goals. No, those are great points. Um I like that as well. You guys both had really good information on that. Dan, I hope we answered your question there. Um, my comment on that, I don't know much about the items you mentioned except for they're, they're pricey, but they're badass. I mean, like Brian said, everybody who uses these that I follow uh, does not complain about them. They're the cast me out. So if you if you want to get into you know the, the Genesis or, uh, or the Furminator, I'm sure you'll be happy. Um, and then the flip side of that, like we kind of started off the conversation with, I've the last, you know, three, four years I've been using a disc. So it really, uh, you know, you, you don't have to go all out and you can still achieve some pretty killer looking food plots, um, without it. So it's really kind of like Al said, how you want to do it, what your goals are, etc. 
Um, yeah, Jared. The one, Jared. The one thing I'd add, I'd add to that, and I didn't, I didn't hit on specifically. Um, and I don't own any of those pieces of equipment, but I can tell you that uh, comparing a Furminator uh, to a Genesis, and get, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, or what was the other one, Plotmaster? Uh, yes. Plotmaster to a Genesis. That's that's not really comparing apples to apples. So, um, from my understanding, now the Genesis Correct. did come out with a grant a groundbreaker, which might be more of an apples to apples comparison because uh, I think it has the uh, disc arrow on the front. But if you're really comparing um, a Genesis, is is traditional Genesis are grain drills, so they have a cut wheel, um, they have your seed box that's calibrated. Uh, that's going to drop seed. You have to calibrate it per acre at which you want to drop the seed. So say 50 pounds of beans per acre. And then you have a cultipacker wheel um, at the back. So that's different. Um, you're, you're literally cutting the soil, dropping a seed in that cut and packing it with the uh, Genesis grain drill um, versus like a Furminator or, or a plot master is going to have a disc harrow. It's going to be a similar concept, but you're actually totally breaking the soil up. You're kind of dropping the seed at the same time. It's not falling in directly into any one crack, and then you're packing it with a long packer wheel um, at, at the back. So you're breaking up more ground um, than necessarily would be needed to, I guess would be the argument for somebody who's extremely pro just a grain drill. So they're, they're not an apples to apples comparison. I just want to make sure that was clear because I don't know um, if my first explanation talks specifically to those ones. Um, but that's, in my opinion, how those differ a little bit. Okay. And would you use either one of them for a different seed as well then, right? Like the drill is more of a corn and bean type thing. Um, does the Furminator or Plotmaster do, even do grains like that? So I believe that, you know, from, from what I've, I've heard, a lot of people are talking um, about, you know, you can do clover to, clover to corn in those type of um, equipment. Okay. Now, w- would you be able to get the type of growth um, in the yields that you would be out of it compared to, like, say, a traditional grill or a drill, excuse me, where you're putting it in perfect rows? I mean, you could probably argue no, right? Because, you know, with the um, Genesis, I have even seen where guys will say, I don't know, I'm, I'm throwing out uh, numbers, but let's say the spacing on the seed drop is six inches. Guys will say, well, I don't want to ha- I want to have, you know, one foot rows. So they'll put duct tape over the gaps in the seed box so that the seed has to fall through the other holes. Um, giving you, you know, larger rows. You can't do that, um, at least with any significant accuracy, with those other uh, pieces of equipment. Okay. Gotcha. All right, guys. Good info there. Moving on. Let's go to kind of. Uh, let's go to our Instagram. We had a user Texas Deer Habitat. I'm implementing a new habitat design that starts with clearing two acres of timber with a chainsaw to create a secure destination food plot. I'd be interested in learning more about screening around for deer. Some people say to drag the trees 50 yards into the forest away from the plot. I think he means treetops or felled trees to create a soft edge. Uh, But also people line their food plots with switchgrass. Um, does that hurt the edge feathering concept? I think the question was, if you drag your, your trees 50 yards into the woods, does that hurt the edge feathering? Or does planting switchgrass around your food plot hurt edge feathering? I think security might need to be covered as well um, in this topic. But which one of you boys wants to chat on that first? Go ahead, Al. Uh, you know, that's, that's a tough one without seeing like an aerial, um, Mm -hmm. you know, because I, I've spent a little bit of time in Texas, lived in, in, uh, Texas and and traveled much of the state, uh, when I was there. So uh, it's hard for me from what I'm picturing of of typical Texas habitats, um, you know, into dragging into the woods. I don't, you know, recall seeing huge, uh, 
timber lots, right, other than maybe in East Texas, which maybe that's where that gentleman is. Um, so it, it's hard to understand for me exactly like the edge feathering um, that he's talking about or the soft edge. I guess my, my question is, um, or my thought on that is, you know, if, if the goal is to create a two-acre food plot and you're, you're clearing a lot of trees, you know, you, you want, you want to make sure it's in a right area, um, of your, of your, um, of your property. Yeah. You, know, you have to, to be able to hunt it, know. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now he's mentioned destination food source, um, I believe in there. So that's the other question I have is, does he plan to hunt this? Yeah. You might not you know? at that point. Yep. So if he's not planning to hunt it and he's just looking to make a hard edge, um, and have a destination of food source, um, I don't know, you know, I, I would be, especially in Texas, you have high coyote populations um, and, and high predator populations in general um, in, in most of the South, uh, in, including Texas. So I don't know if I would want to have huge mounds of treetops um, surrounding the edge of the field. I mean, from uh, most of the things I've heard, uh, Dr. Grant Woods talks about that a lot. He goes, man, you have a huge pile of, of uh, treetops or something like that. You know, people think it's creating an edge, which it might be, but it, it also might be creating a place for, um, you know, predators to hide. Um, you know, but Joe can open up a whole nother discussion, right, on, on their actual impact on deer populations, which we probably don't have the time to get into tonight. <laughs> but I think that that would be a, a few of my questions there would be like, well, what's the goal of the plot? You know, is it, is it to feed deer? And what's the surrounding area look like currently? Um, and, and then try to go from there. So the other thing is, is clearing two acres uh, with a chainsaw and dragging that much um, stuff out. My only suggestion is when I was hearing that is like, you know, obviously it depends on financial situation and stuff, but uh, you know, one, depending on the type of trees, if there's any, any at all timber value there, you might want to consider, you know, um, selling some of that timber off and then offsetting the cost by bringing in a dozer or skid steer to pop some of those stumps out and move some things around to get that plot how you want it. Um, you know, that might be worth it because, you know, you try to do two acres with a chainsaw, one guy or two guys. Uh, it can, it can take some time, especially when you talk about clearing the ground. Uh, so that, that's kind of a tough question to answer um, for me. So I'll let B, uh, fill in any spots I missed, which I think there were a few. <laughs> no, just to uh, piggyback on what Al said, um, he, he covered uh, some, some good topics there and some good made some good points about, you know, looking at the big picture when it comes to um, not only what your, what your goals are, if it's going to be a destination food plot, if you're going to hunt it, if there's a predator issue, but uh, I'll try to boil it down to just a couple of simple answers for the questions here. First off, anything that uh, Jeff Sturgis has done, you know, he's been doing this, you know, 20 plus years and he's done it on hundreds, if not thousands of properties around the country. So guys like him, uh, Jake Eagunger, um, Eric Long, any of those habitat consultants that have been doing this for a long time, you know, and, and they'll tell you like when we had Eric on, it's situational, but for the most part, if those guys are doing something, it's working and you can't go wrong with taking their advice. Um, dragging the trees in, what, what I think he's talking about is if he clears the two acres, instead of just pushing it all into one pile, maybe spread it out and drag it into the surrounding timber. Uh, I don't think that'll hurt the edge feathering. Uh, just make sure you're not creating a blockade where you don't want a blockade. I mean, obviously, it's good to block off some areas, you know, where the wind might not be right. You don't want the deer going that way because you're not going to be able to set up and hunt that. But um, definitely make sure you have a plan to where you're putting those piles where you're dragging those trees and uh you know something as simple as walking through with a chainsaw and opening up a deer sized trail is all you need mm -hmm. if, if you end up making the pile too constrictive because i've done that i'll go in there like a madman and hinge cut something and then i'm like oh boy 
I did a little too much here. But then you just spend an afternoon making a couple deer trails through there, and they'll they'll use it and find it. You just don't want to make it so blocked that you think um, so blocked that they're not going to feel comfortable. Because uh, I mean, if, if you don't want them going somewhere drop as much as you can or stack up as much as you can because it's not going to matter. They're not going to go there. But if you're going to go back in and cut a chainsaw path through there, make sure it's open enough. You know, you want to control their movement, but you don't want them to feel like they're in a tunnel. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to hurt the edge feathering concept. Just getting sunlight to the ground, you know, 20 yards wide around your food plot once you get it cleared. The sunlight will do its thing. Uh, if you end up with uh, something growing that you don't want, if fire or herbicide doesn't control it, you can till it up and put switchgrass. That's a, that's a great option too. You just want something where the deer are going to feel comfortable coming up to that soft edge. They'll be a lot more um, likely to use that during daylight hours, whereas when you have the hard edge going from timber to open, you know, they'll have a staging area further back, and you might never see those deer in that plot during daylight hours. Man, Brian, you must be the co-host of this show because I don't have anything to say. <laughs> now, you guys both, you, you guys, Too you guys both did awesome on that. I, I would totally agree. And, and like you said, Al, in Texas, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how that is, or if this question was in Minnesota. Or wherever it may be, I think um, you definitely don't want to box in the deer. But I also walked a property today of a friend of mine, uh, Alan, down in, in Jackson, down by my farm, and and be like you said, when he hinge cuts and drops stuff, I mean it is impenetrable. Then you know, so even around the edges of the food plot, it's impenetrable except for enough space for the deer to come in and out you do not want to block them in or box them in like you said um yeah it's inter it's interesting right because like we you know brian said it in creating that soft edge yep um it's so hard to picture without like a, uh, at least an aerial or something like that but the way um brian was describing i'm like oh that does make sense you know so um you know kind of dragging things off to give it that soft edge. I don't think I understood the question as, as much as once he kind of painted that picture, you know, for me, one of the things that I've set the goal out to do is, you know, we came in with, with dozers and, and made some plots and I've so actually, what did you guys decided, do with all the, the tops and the tree trunks? I mean, you didn't drag them far off into the woods. No, no. I mean, we, we basically, um, well, depending on what plots so or some of the one plots, end of the field or something. Yeah, I mean, some of the plots are were in areas where there used to be um, old four wheeler trails where we didn't really want folks <laughs> riding four wheelers anymore, right? So things like that. Um, so we actually pushed everything and made like a mountain um, to block off that uh, trespassing trailer or uh, trail or four wheeler trail. Um, in in other cases. Uh, we made where maybe there was a road, we made a high, kind of a higher wall um, up where you can't see uh, as much. But, you know, some of those have been in place for almost 10 years. And what has naturally happened is, you know, erosion or, uh, yeah, I guess erosion and, and just decomposition of the material. So those piles that once seemed to be so large are not quite as large as, as they used to be. Um I will tell you that they're home for things like groundhogs. Um, you know, I've shot a heck of a lot of groundhogs coming out of piles like that. That's why I tell people, I'm like, oh, if you can avoid that, um, if I had to do it again, I, w I would avoid it. Um, again, our terrain is very, very hilly. So that adds um, some complications to, you know, where you can push things in and whatnot. But getting back to that soft edge, you know, I went back and identified as I've learned more too, right? I mean, I've, I'm pretty analytical, as you you guys know from just the way I think about things. No, and, and not question, you. <laughs> and question, <laughs> and question things, and 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 then re-question it, and say, hey, I think this is what I'm thinking, and then question it again, right? But I finally have felt confident enough to go in and and identify. Okay, I got uh, 25, you know, maple trees growing up around this plot, and. Um, 
wh- why do I have these here? You know, and, and I'm going to hinge those back towards, you know, the timber, um, or maybe all the way around the type thing. And, and exactly. Or at least, um, you know, depending on, on how the plots lay, um, <clears throat> at least on one side, you know, where the deer typically come from to create that soft edge, add more natural brows, um, add a little bit more of a thicket feeling yep. um, versus just having that, you know, hey, I'm in big, you know, red oak timber and okay, now I'm in a three acre food plot. Um, I can say that we've had a lot of opportunities in all of our food plots. I mean, I don't think it's been a major hindrance by not having um, a soft edge, but also some of them have kind of a natural soft edge transition zone just based on topography, um, based on some older clear cuts that were done in the last five years or so. But I think that's definitely something that can be considered as well is, uh, you know, if you clear the plot first, you can still take the, I mean, eventually you're going to have an edge, right? Unless you take your whole property and turn it into a field. I mean, event, and even then you're eventually going to have an edge, right? And um, on those edges, you can take those remaining trees and fall them uh, into the woods or fall them towards the plot or what have you. And then you get the benefits of stump um, sprouts yep. as well as the natural browse from the hinge cut and you create point. that soft edge. Um, that's something that we're starting to do. And I've been really slow to hinge cut because, uh, you know, you, you start firing up your saws like – I definitely tell people, learn your trees, right? You know, I'm not going to go in there and start hinging every white oak I see. Uh, at least that's on my property. That's my thoughts. But uh, just just something else to consider, um, you know, especially that's a big job. You know, a two-acre yeah, clear, clear cut with, with one guy and a, hand, and a chainsaw or a couple guys and a chainsaw, that's a, that's a big job. So those are some things I would consider um, into helping create that soft edge. Yeah, it's kind of hard to to take a, a specific question as we're learning and and trying to answer it 100% correct because everything if you talk to any habitat consultant everything is situational. Um yeah. But I think the main important bullet items from this are do not box the deer in with too much of a barrier around the food plot, you know, don't make a a full circle and then cut one entrance into the into the food plot. Um, I would recommend edge feathering. Definitely. We talk about that more on, uh, I think it's the episode number 23 with Chase Burns. Um, he has a really good way of describing edge feathering as well. So if you guys haven't listened to that, check that out. But if you can get that, that hard edge, like Brian said, from where you're walking through the timber, boom, to a field edge, you know, the deer always stop back in the woods and they just stare out there right so if you can make them you know soften that edge feather that edge for the term where they feel comfortable going out the extra 30 yards towards the open food plot you know maybe that's now in your shooting lane um if, if you're hunting it so i think uh you know that there's some good some good things there um muscanthus another thing you could plant around the edge to to give you some to cover some, you know, quick one, two, three year cover uh, for screening. So, some just some different things there. Border I think patrol. It's a, yeah, border patrol from killer food plots, of course. Um, that's that's, a, that's another thing to consider if you're going to yep. open up a two acre square or a two acre. Uh, oh, definitely power cut glass. that field up. Yep. Yeah, whatever whatever shape you're going to make it, uh, that that's what uh, Nick Percy recommends, and and I've seen it with some of the. Um, uh, Egyptian wheat and other screenings, and of course I'm using Border Patrol this year to do it. Um, you can basically steer the deer where you want them to go in that plot right. by just having a strip of taller cover that they feel more comfortable either walking alongside or through. So that's something else to consider also. Yeah, and that kind of, not to dwell on this too much, but I mean, even Jake Elinger, he'll he'll tell you if you have a rectangular food plot, he'll he'll plant a strip of trees or or something right through the middle of it, divide it in two. You know, make that buck check both plots before he continues on his his route that night. You know, make and that's what Nick does with the border patrol. You know, he got a, a big rectangle, divide it into four. I mean, you'll make that buck travel to to maybe in, within your shooting lane to check the other corner of the food plot versus. 
just being out there. Yeah. And so, like, with the question, a two-acre food plot is a big food plot, in my opinion, and maybe more of a destination food plot, which you might not want to hunt on. So some of these questions might be moot compared, you know, if you're not going to hunt on it. Sure, sure, situational. So you got to think about that, too. Um, yeah, I think you also have to consider, too, like, we're, you know, obviously, where is it at in the, in the country? You know, a lot of times, I think a two-acre food plot, and, and Brian, you're probably the same thing. In Ohio, you know, we have a very short gun season, and most of our hunting is with, with a bow. And, you know, two-acre food plot, you're not shooting across that with a bow. No. You know? No. Um, but, no, no. but in some of the southern um, southern states with longer rifle seasons, you know, you could get in very limited access. You could be looking at a two-acre food plot from 150 yards away. That's so true. it could be a totally different – you know, yeah, it's a destination food plot nine times out of ten, but when you do go in there to hunt hunt it, you know, uh, a good friend of mine always says, he's like, it's one of those stands when you go in there, something's going to die <laughs> because, you know, it's low impact, <laughs> but if you're in there and, and you have the risk of burning it at all, you better be taking something out of there, and it could be that situation as well. You know, we, we don't have a lot of that um, in Ohio, so it's hard for – for, for myself and I'm sure B you probably feel similar like you know we have such a short gun season it's one week for sure. long and, and and typically you don't have um, long shots so that's something else to consider you know is to you know where is it in the country and, and how is that hunting you know different if you're sitting there with 30 out six or something like that and you can shoot a deer from 200 yards away uh, two acre food plot seems a whole lot smaller all right well Texas Deer Habitat, I appreciate your, your uh, contribution on Instagram. If you have any other questions on that, just hit us up. We'd be happy to maybe dive into it a little bit further uh, with your situation and, and be able to help there. Um, guys, great information on that. That was uh, that was awesome. It, like I said, this, this food plot I walked today, I mean, when this guy cuts, he cuts. And there's just, it made me realize that I do not cut near enough when I'm when I'm opening up the canopy I mean and, and Jake if you watch Jake's videos these guys are just destroying you know what I mean and I, <laughs> I I don't I don't do that yet but I can see I can see what they're doing and I see the bucks they kill and I'm you know starting to click so it's very just it's situational but it's very interesting you know one more thing I wanted to add on that and I'm sorry but I, I just I was thinking about it earlier and one other thing that I would I know I'm getting very intrigued by it, and I want to do more of it. I think Brian said earlier, Steve Bartelia um, talks about it. But, you know, you take an area where you have a, a food plot like that, and don't overlook, um, depending on the terrain and your situation, um, you know, cutting or, or edge feathering some of the trails that you know deer are, are traveling um, heavily to get to that food plot. So, for instance, I'll talk about my farm some more. Is, you know, we have big timber that it comes into a food plot and being able to go in there and say, all right, I know that this trail is used by deer every single day. And if I edge feather both sides of that given trail to make it a little bit thicker, um, let's say 50 yards from that plot. So Al, it just gives Al, it, Al, not to interrupt, but what do you mean when you say edge feather the trail? Are you talking about hinge cutting trees to the perpendicular? Exactly. So um, not necessarily going over the trail, but on both sides. To give the softening deer. the edges of the trail exactly, and okay. I think, I forget uh, what Steve calls it, but he, he talked about he has like these S winding trails um, going all through you know his property from one plot to the next to the bedding and and it, it's essentially giving the deer you know quote unquote tunnels um, or safe the walkways that he talks about yeah exactly yeah, I think you're right B exactly and. Uh, I think that's something worth considering, you know, as well. And another way you can add security and another kind of soft edge um, to those trails to kind of funnel those deer up through those points where you want them to enter um, and make them feel a little bit more secure. And yeah. natural browse along both edges all the way into your plot so they're spending more time. Absolutely. Yep, and, w and when you're doing that perpendicular hinge cut away from the trail to your left and to your right, what that's doing versus the parallel hinge cut, if you're to drop trees, you know, like a hallway, um, it gives the deer that non 
blockade effect where he or she can dash, you know, left or right at any point and escape. Versus if you were to lay him, you know, right along the trail, it'd be it'd be a more of a tunnel effect and maybe a little bit too constrictive. But definitely right. a great yeah. point, though. So. Definitely great points. All right, moving on to J. W. Lewis. I think that's uh, Jason, if I'm correct. How many hours spent prepping in the off season? How does that compare to the number of hours actually spent hunting? Just to give us <laughs> amateurs a reference point, I was speaking with a pro last week who said he spends 200 to 300 hours in prep and expects to have his target buck down in four hunts max. Whoa. Speaking with a pro. Whoa. That is... Uh, Man, I got to get that guy's plan. Yeah, four hunts max. <laughs> yeah. Wrong, wrong podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jason, uh, you might want to call call that pro on that question. No, I, uh, I mean... What I've learned over the last couple of years um, is that the more you prep, you know, get get your habitat to where you can as soon as you can before, you know, what I call my stay out time um, and, and before you hunt. So I try to get as much of it as I can done. This, you know, this habitat stuff, as you guys both know, is a never ending journey. Uh, it's always changing. So really, I've never, never documented the hours each year, but um, I know that anybody who has his target bucked down in four hunts or less, or even more, say it's one to eight, those guys, I'm almost positive, scout more than they hunt. So now we're kind of getting to the, the scouting side of things. Um, if you understand your habitat which means if you go in there as soon as hunting season's done and you're walking your farm and you thought, okay, well, I hinge cut this bedding area or maybe I had timber people come in and take this out. Man, the deer are really focused here. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're using this trail. Maybe they're not. I mean, that's all That's all preparation. That's all scouting. And you can adjust your, your habitat plan to that. You know, maybe some of your trees in your bedding area tipped over and blocked the trail. Well, you got to get in there and cut those out, as, as Jim Brocker would say, manicure your bedding area. Um, as far as, you know, the the relation to how much preparation versus hunting, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the people that I follow that are very successful scout and put in the time and work ahead of time way more than they hunt. I mean, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, 10 to 1. You know what I mean? So... That's kind of just my uh, my high level comments on that. Which one do you want to go next? Go ahead, Brian. Well, it, well, a lot of it. What it comes down to is pressure. So if if this this guy that he talked to, if he's hunting in an unpressured area, um, you know that's very feasible. I, I can remember one year, and and you guys might remember this. I had a uh, pretty nice buck with a bunch of trash threw out some kickers and he had a couple drop times and stuff and I had him on camera. He was coming to my back soybean field every day and I just stayed out of there the, the entire month of um, September and I waited till the first cold front with the right wind for where he was coming from and he read the script perfectly. Unfortunately, and, and Chris Hanberry still gives me a hard time about this to this day, is I'm, I'm super conservative with cutting shooting lanes, and I'm getting a little bit better at taking more down, but it, it cost me a shot at that deer. I mean, he, he, was, he did what mature bucks do. He stayed in the cover, and he made it very difficult for me to get a shot at him, but he read the script, and he wasn't pressured. So that that's a big thing to consider too. You know, it's possible to do that if, if you have the right conditions. You're definitely you're definitely going to be able to spend less time hunting, but you've got to be a, a really good steward of your land. You've got to be uh, paying attention and scouting, like Jared said. If you, if you know your deer herd and know what they're doing, and you put the work in you probably will spend less time hunting. And that's that's the goal of why we're doing all this. Yeah, 
Yep, exactly. And I think that has to relate to, uh, you know, the way we're talking about staying out is, and, and maybe the his target buck down in four hunts, quote unquote, that has to do with pressure as well, right? I mean, sometimes maybe that was the fourth day in the season and he hunted four days in a row, but, um, you know, a lot of it's the right time to jump in there too. Al, what do you think about that? That's a, a really interesting question. Um, because I question like, okay, what, are, are we talking, you know, habitat management or are we talking killing big deer? Because I think sometimes people have a direct correlation with the two. Um, and I don't think it always is, it's not instant uh, satisfaction or you're not going to get instant gratification because you planted some fruit trees. Now you're going to kill 150 inch deer in four days. Uh, <laughs> I think that you do habitat <laughs> management because you believe in bettering wildlife from from honeybees to to whitetail you know you believe jared maybe in your case you know i I look at it this way i tell my wife all the time i go you know i'm planting these fruit trees because someday you know i hope to have children that i take here and say hey your dad planted this tree and now we're picking fruit off of it um and deer you know eat from it um and i hinge cut this to provide better browse and better cover to give turkey poults a, a better opportunity to survive so so I, I don't think that it's a direct correlation between habitat management and increasing, um, you know, the pride you take in your farm or your land and, and killing mature deer. I can tell you, um, you know, I'm blessed to own a decent sized farm, at least from my perspective, and I could kill larger deer on smaller chunks of ground in the right area in far less time than I spend on habitat management and hunting the deer that I decide to hunt on my own farm. Um, and what I mean by that is like you guys said, pressure, you know, if I went and and knocked on doors in, um, you know, in, in certain areas, for instance, there were some guys, I don't remember their names now, but they were known for killing big deer in the suburbs of Columbus. And I'm not saying they never did any habitat management, but they would get a 10 acre piece that they had permission to hunt. And, you know, they'd be in the stand and they'd hear, you know, ambulances going to the hospital. Right. But they were killing 200 inch deer every year. Um, I would say that's much more into the scouting and into the property and into where the big deer are versus necessarily increasing the habitat. Um, So I think that that's, a little bit of a tough question to answer as to how many hours you put in. I know when I was in college, uh, I logged one year, and I think I stopped counting at over 200 hours I was spending a tree stand. So I was over four hunts, and uh, I don't think I <laughs> killed, a, killed a buck that year. But um, I enjoyed every minute of it, you know. So to me, and I, and I planned probably throughout that time, I continued to plan habitat management. So for, for me – the habitat management part of it never really stops. That's the I mean, best part. I, yeah. I mean, when I'm in a tree stand, I'm planning. Um, when I'm not in a tree stand, I'm planning. You know, when I'm at the farm, I'm doing one job and I'm planning what the, what the next job is going to be. <laughs> um, I think that we can get caught up as a hunting group in success being how many big bucks have you harvested I think that's a really slippery slope, especially when comparing it to habitat management. For sure, um, for sure. You know, <laughs> uh, Eric Long, is one of the most well-respected uh, wildlife biologists in, in the United States, probably. Um, a good friend of mine, Bill Penniston out of Athens County, Ohio, uh, who's, who's been around for a, a long, long time. Very good wildlife biologist. And, and the list goes on and on and on. And um you know, my, my buddy Bill has killed stacks of good bucks, but he doesn't do it every single year. And, uh, I mean, he, he almost does, but I mean, it's not every single year. And, and I don't think any less of him or any advice that I would ask of him or Eric or, or any other wildlife biologist, because one year they didn't kill it, kill a big buck in four days. So, um, not trying to knock that question, 
but I, I just think from, from he, you know, he said as an amateur, I think as an amateur, one thing I would look at is what are my goals? Is it just to harvest big deer? Cause if that's the case, um, you know, habitat management is, is, is a long haul, right? You know, it's a lot of small steps to meet the end goal and it's kind of ever evolving. It's fluid versus, um, you know, I just want to shoot big deer. If I just wanted to shoot big deer, I'd spend my money going to Illinois or Iowa every year on a, on a, um, on a hunt, Right. you know? So well, I, I just yeah. think those are things to consider. No, I think, uh, I think goals has been part of each answer to each of your questions today so far. And I, I like that. I don't think, uh, talk about that enough. Um, and I think it all depends and there's on, no, there's, there's no there. magic pixie dust, right. you know, right. Dan Infault talks about his style of hunting with the hunting beast. People ask him, well, what's the secret to doing this? What, tell Scouting. me the thing that you do. And it's, he's like, it's not a thing. It's, it's a process mm-hmm. and you've got to dedicate yourself to it. It's not going to happen overnight. And the same thing with habitat management. Right. And if you're a pro, I'm sure your farm is more dialed in or you've been doing it longer um, than maybe I have or, or some, some of the listeners. So I think that has to weigh in on it too. Again, a lot of these questions are situational, but I think it's, it's they're good questions to, to talk about and cover. And, and I mean, absolutely. If, if this guy can get his, his buck down on four hunts, I bet his farm is better looking than mine. I'm just. I, oh yeah, and, more power to him. And I applaud oh, yeah, him for absolutely. that because I'm sure there was years of work that went into that to get it the way it is, and I'm sure he knows a lot about what he's doing uh, to be able to make yeah, a absolutely. statement like that. That's yeah. I, I like you said, Al. It's a it's a long haul, and depending on where you're at in the process, is going to determine the answer to that question. Well, and sure, one of the things you know that I I have to have to say because I I hate to hear you know I don't know how old the guy is who answers ask that question you know but seeing like oh you know some amateur right so it's like all right I, I would hate to see somebody be discouraged because they feel like oh man i'm not even close it took me five years to harvest a deer right you know or, or, or big buck or, or whatever like it's so much it's so much of this is based on the property right. you know there are properties throughout the midwest that nobody's ever done the hinge cut nobody's ever hung a trail camera probably on them and they have great deer I mean, let, let, let's be realistic on this, but one of the things like in, in, when I look at my farm is, you know, we started and we hung cameras and if I had one deer that was a four and a half year old deer, that was the deer we hunted all year, you know, two, three guys, um, not all at the same time, but two or three guys. And that was the deer we hoped to kill, you know, and last year I probably had seven deer, um, on our farm that I th- said, all right, I'd kill any of those and be happy. So when somebody talks to you and says, I kill a, a, a target buck in four days, they may be watching 15 deer um, throughout that summertime period that they consider to be good and mature deer. With the average hunter, you know, who's running trail cameras on, on the back 40 uh, that they have permission to hunt might be, maybe has one deer or maybe hasn't even had a deer show up on trail camera that they even want to hunt yet. So it, it's all situational, but don't lose, you know, the drive to hunt or the drive to do habitat or the drive to better soil because you didn't kill a mature deer in four days. I mean, that's, 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 I guess the, the big uh, push that I'm having on this is just, you know, don't get discouraged because I spent 10 years doing this and I don't kill a deer in four days. And uh, there's been guys who just spent a lot longer than me and some have been successful and some haven't, but just some things to consider. Well, Al, it sounds like you're not working hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess not. No, I'm I'm totally kidding. I and but and the the flip side to to your comment, which your comment is amazing, because I mean that's where I'm at. I I want my farm to be better, and it just takes time, and you know, instant gratification is not. There's no pixie dust. It's not just you know, plant this apple tree and you're gonna kill a booner. It's not how it works. Uh, but I, I would say for the guys who are out there every weekend, you know, and, you know, putting in these plots and everything else and, and doing the work that, uh, you know, you reap what you sow. So I think, uh, there's that side of it too. All right, guys. Well, moving on from listener questions, I want to thank all the listeners for sending those in. 
Um, I wanted to wrap this up. We're kind of coming up on time here, but I wanted to wrap this up with maybe some some goals of 2019. Um, Al, why don't you go ahead and take this? What are maybe some habitat and or hunting goals that you set for yourself on your farm here in 2019? What's on the table down there in Southern Ohio? Yeah, I mean, so the goals for us continue to kind of be um, the same as every year. I mean, better hunt, we want to continue to have better and better hunting, um, you know, uh, from, from year in and year out. I guess for me, one of the biggest things is tweaking stand locations. Um, you know, that continues to be something where I feel we could get, do better and better um you know, one of the things when I first started hanging tree stands, it felt like I hung a stand on the side of a maple tree and, and um, stuck out like a sore thumb, you know, and, and kind of been like, oh, okay, well, let's look for a triple trunk maple or, or a big oak or, or what have you. So it, it always is a goal for me to continue to tweak stand locations. Um, there's been a few stands, honestly, that have been up for a while uh, that I just think, you know what, killed a few deer out of those. Um, I think the deer are educated on those stand locations, so moving some of those. So, so that's a goal um, is to try to get some of those fine tweaked and also um, continue to scout. I mean, we've, you know, purchased some additional land. We were very fortunate to do a couple of years ago, and uh, we don't know it that well. So continue to scout that, um, you know, and, and continue to get uh, get some trees planted. I mean, I'm going to be planting some fruit trees this year, um, actually on Friday. Um, continue to run camera surveys, um, you know, and just enjoy the time. I mean, I don't really have any, I want to kill a, a 160 or anything. Like I'd love to, but uh, I don't have any real set in stone goals, but uh, just continue to make tweaks and, and continue to work to improve the soil health. That's been a big push for me. Um, I, I went to mostly clover and chicory plots um, the last few years and uh, have really limited my uh, tilling because of that so i tilled when i planted um, but have not tilled since um, and and i do plan to put in some fall plots but a lot of that's done with overseeding um, as, as well as some limited uh, tilling i might kill like a strip um, but but you know continuing to try to increase the organic matter in my soil in our part of southern ohio it's pretty heavy clay based soil so um, not the best so that's kind of my goals for, for 2019, 2020. I mean, kept trying to keep it pretty simple, pretty straightforward, um, trying to not put a lot of pressure on myself or the, or the the family. You know, sometimes I kind of choke. I'm like, I take this way too serious. <laughs> I got to have I gotta have fun, you know. Oh, you can't be upset there. because a three-year-old uh, blew you out of the tree, right? I mean, it's like the, I, I used to, you know, even a few years ago, I'd be like, oh, that that stands burn, you know, son of a, and, and you get so, and it's like, it's a deer, you know, like, let's just have fun. Like, let's yeah. talk, that was an amazing hunt. You saw a great deer and, and, and let's figure out how to, how to harvest, harvest it the next time, you know? Um, so definitely, definitely some of the goals for me. And also I'm going to shoot more does because I like shooting deer with a bow and I'm going to, I'm going to definitely shoot more does uh, this coming year. So those, that's it. That's, those are my goals. Okay, and what is your? I like to ask favorite tree questions. So, what is your favorite tree you're planting this year? Favorite tree to plant this year. Oof. What would you buy that's going in this year that you're like, I'm gonna kill a I'm booner obs- because I'm, I planted this tree. Yeah, I'm I'm obsessed with apple trees. To be to be honest, I mean, I just I'm just totally obsessed with them. Um, so any apple tree, I like the disease resistant varieties. Um. Your Jonah Free, your Enterprise, uh, so so apple trees tend to be my favorites. Pears are a close second, um, just because pears are, from my experience, at least pretty easy. They're kind of set them and forget them, you know, type of tree. You can, might want to throw some seven dust on them uh, for Japanese beetles. But this year, I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with an apple, uh, one of the apple varieties. I think I do have an Enterprise and a Jonah Free. Um, that I'll be planting this weekend. So, so one of those disease-resistant apple varieties is probably my favorite to plant. Okay, thanks for that. Moving on, B, what do you got going on this year that's going to blow some minds? 
Well, I expect to have my target buck down in four hunts max. Oh, baby. <laughs> and what's your target no. buck this year? Is he a four corn or what you got planned? Yeah, Ashtabula <laughs> County 11 point. There you spiker. go. A little spiker. No, it's just uh, more of the same. Um, I'm still working on, you know, when I bought my farm, uh, the commercially farmed fields were just a hard edge up against uh, some old um, clear cuts that were regenerated with mostly uh, maples, which don't offer the deer much once they get up above 10 feet. So I'm still working on a lot of TSI and um, trying to do some different blocks of early successional growth. Every year I try to take out, you know, a half acre or so. So we have staggered, uh, ages of of forest so it's not all open for the deer uh you know they talk about you want to try to have everything from five foot down is where the where the deer like to spend their time so i'm trying to create as much of that as i can uh we're going to go with some more um warm season grasses Uh, i planted a lot of egyptian wheat last year but it was a lot of work and it's an annual yeah i'm 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 adding more perennials to try to cut down on the time that I've got to spend. Cause like Al said, you know, we put a lot of pressure on the families and, and spending a lot of time up there trying to get everything done. And, and some of the perennials will help us, you know, take some of that edge off where you think you gotta be up there planting all these annuals and which are good to have incorporated, you know, the, the variety is always the way to go, but try to add some more perennials. Um, I've got some buckthorn that I've got to keep an eye on. So I'm always monitoring the invasives and it, it's double edged sword because buckthorn is fantastic deer cover, but you don't want it to get to the point where it gets out of control and starts taking over where all some of the native stuff is growing. Um, I think you, I think it was you, Jared shared the article about the, um, the red, uh, what was that that plant you shared about? That that red osier dogwood. Oh, osier dogwood. Yeah, I've got a lot of native uh, clumps of that, and the buckthorn competes with that. So I gotta I gotta I gotta uh, keep an eye on that stuff. Yes. And um, working on a fence project. I've been fencing okay. off my my borders uh, with the flat ground. It's tough because the deer can pretty much go anywhere. So with a combination of, you know, hinge cutting and some fence gaps and, and some things, some tips we talked about with Mark Drury, I'm trying to create more funnel areas since I don't have any natural funnels. So Brian, that's that, basically what I'm after this year. That property I walked today, the guy had a seven-foot fence that was uh, part of his access. So he he come off the... The road was one of his property borders, and he'd walk, you know, 150 yards to his to his blind. I mean, it's more like probably 100 yards. And uh, one of the things that kept happening were the the does and the bucks would circle back behind him and hit his access trail. So he he fenced it, and yeah. um, it works. It's very interesting, Absolutely. and uh, so good for you for trying that with either hinge cutting, fencing, or both. I think it's a good plan. Right. That's awesome. So what do you got going on? Well, um, I would like to, I've, I've complained about it a few times, how I, I kind of mowed down my, my open areas when I bought the property and you now they're kind of wide open. I'm trying to get that built back up. Um, and that's going to be a combination of things. I'm dropping some, some hinge cut trees into the food plot. I'm edge feathering. I'm dra- I'm going to drag some tops around and I'm going to make a, instead of a big rectangular plot, if you will, I'm going to try to have a large V shape almost, um, or like an hourglass and right where it pinches down is going to be where my tree stand is. So I'm going to try to work on, on getting that project done just to see how it works. Um, if it doesn't work at all, then I got to figure something else out. Or if I, I block it too much, then at least I'll know. But if I can guide these deer to to come far enough south around a couple of these trees that I dropped, um, 
it's going to be a game changer for sure. Um, I want to hang a, a two-person ladder to get my kids out there this year. They're going to come out there with me um, nice. this year. So that's a big goal of mine. Uh, I'd also like I have to build a real set of stairs to get up to my 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 bow hunting blind on the platform that that hard sided blind. Uh, there's some hillbilly out there put a an aluminum ladder with some ratchet straps on the on the platform and he, and he used that all of 2018. <laughs> but uh, I'm I frown upon making my daughters climb up and down that thing in the dark. That's not gonna happen. So I gotta build some real stairs. Um, nice. I, I like to cut more, cut more trees, cut more canopy. I I, I walked this guy's property today. I mentioned it uh, probably too many times now, but the amount of trees that this guy and Jake Ellinger drop and 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 open up, and I mean, it, I'm not doing half of what they're doing. If I'm like I'm, it's not near enough. So I'd like to, without going too insane, um, try a little bit more this year. See what happens. See how the deer react. And then maybe you know, go further into it in the future if if it, if all is good. But I'm also trying to get a logger in there. Um, I was talking with Ty Miller, and he uh, he was thinking about some of the pictures I sent him that I don't have enough canopy opened up either. So. I'm trying to get some people to log the back half of my property, but nobody wants to do it because it's so small. So if there's any loggers listening out there in Michigan, you got, you want to come take 25 to 50 oaks out for me, they may be yours for the right price. So trying to do that. Um, and then lastly, just kind of got this bug about hunting some public land. You know, Brian, you did it last year on some on some public, and, and I always hunt it for, for gun season but um yeah i mean like the dan infault style you're kind of limiting yourself on where you can go when you hunt private there's four four corners and uh i know here in michigan the big deer live out in the swamps so i'd like to try to get out there and and at least i'm not gonna say i want to get out there and kill a three-year-old this year but i'd like to at least get out there and lay my eyes on a buck or at least keep looking until i find some good bedding um I don't know. Very nice. I just named like 45 things. I don't have enough time in the day to, <laughs> you know, wipe how that goes. But anywho, um, yeah, that's, those are my plans, guys. Lots of work. Uh, plus there's trees coming in. Um, yeah, lots to do. But I really enjoyed this episode. Um, I haven't got to catch up with you guys both on the phone in a while. So thank you both for getting on. I thought it was awesome. Right. I hope the listeners grab a thing or two from this. Uh when they're looking at their property plans this year. So we got to have Al on more. He's got some excellent ideas and, and I thoroughly enjoy the group texts that we have going just about every day. And he's <laughs> always thinking about things from perspectives that I don't ever think about. And it gives me something to consider. And I think it makes me a better habitat manager. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful that we have him every day with our text messages and, glad he was able to come on tonight i yeah, thanks i Pete. echo that definitely definitely yeah thanks guys no i i i enjoy it a lot i enjoy bouncing ideas off i i enjoy um you know talking with you guys i think i would articulate better in, in person sometimes than, <laughs> than over the telephone but uh you know hopefully it, it comes across semi-clear to, to you and the audience and uh you know it's, it's it's a lot of fun i mean it's a lot of fun talking about um you know, something that we're all very, very passionate about. And I look forward to the next time we get to chat and, uh, B we're going to get together and we're going to do a, uh, a property tour at some point, whether it's my farm or your farm or both of them. Yeah. I'm it's sure coming up soon. Hook up in Ohio. Yep. And, uh, you're going to teach me how to score deer properly. <laughs> I am. I am. I'll bring the tape measure. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you guys, but I was thinking more of a, a 2020 spring turkey hunt on the on the owl farm. But you know, whatever, no big deal. Either way, we'll hey. make it happen. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Come on down. It would be Come nice to. Uh, I got a lot of birds. Catch up with you guys soon. That's for sure. So, guys, thank you again so much for coming on. Uh, I'm gonna wrap this up. All right, buddy. Thank you once again, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of the Habitat Podcast. 
Thanks to our buddy Al, part of the podcast, for jumping on here tonight. Brian, what would you think about that, buddy? I had a really good time chatting with you guys. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. I, I always enjoy talking to Al, especially in person, like he mentioned, because he brings such a unique perspective. And uh, he just just the way he phrases questions and the way he, he flows his answers, it's, it's – uh, I think our listeners are really going to appreciate everything he brought to the table tonight, and I hope we get to do it again. Yep, and it was very interesting how we kind of got to dive into the listener questions, which I appreciated. Uh, We should do that more because normally we're talking about maybe one person's situation in one part of the country for the entire episode, where here we kind of broke it down. It could have been four or five different situations regarding one question. And that was kind right. of interesting to me. I had fun doing that. Um, Definitely. You know, I, I'm hunting Michigan. You're hunting PA in Ohio and Al's down in southern Ohio. I mean, we're in different parts of the country, and our listeners are too. So that was pretty fun to do that. Well, I wanted to thank Al and Brian both. Thank you, boys, for coming on. Um, I want to thank the listeners for coming back once more. Uh, you know, if, if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, go to our our iTunes account, or the podcast app. Leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to the podcast. Uh, that really helps us, uh, you know, climb the charts, if you will, and appear to more habitat enthusiasts like yourselves when people are looking for podcasts. So, or even if it's Stitcher, or Podbean, or Spotify, leave us a good review on there. Um, and let me know if you do. I'll send you a free decal. Uh, just shoot, shoot me a message on Facebook. Be happy to do that. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Michigan Whitetail Pursuit. Killer Food Plots, The Habitat Hook, Packer Max Call to Packers, and Dip That Hydrographics. Uh, if you haven't heard, our buddy Gabe is getting some updates. He's getting some movement in his legs. And uh, I just want to say if everybody can keep, keep praying for Gabe and go on our Facebook and, and make sure to find the GoFundMe on there and uh, help support him and his family through these times, that'd be awesome. Uh, he's a good sponsor and friend. So. Get on there and check that out. And then uh, last but not least, you can find all of our episodes if you're new at HabitatPodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Podbean, wherever you find a podcast, even Facebook and Instagram. Find us on there, uh, YouTube as well. So thank you guys once again for coming on as we become better Habitat managers. We'll be back again soon with another great episode.